Welcome back to the series on recursion. In this part, we'll cover some pitfalls to recursion and give some reasons why you might want to avoid it in general. As we've seen, recursion can be a useful problem-solving technique. Divide and conquer algorithmic strategies are usually presented as recursive algorithms, and we'll see several more examples later on. Functional programming languages such as Lisp or Haskell use recursion as a fundamental control flow mechanism. Some of these functional style programming languages discourage or even omit traditional loop control structures. So recursion ends up being the go-to mechanism for these languages. In practice, however, recursion is not strictly speaking necessary to a programming language like C. It's a non-trivial fact that any recursive function that you can write in C can be rewritten using a loop or a smart data structure to eliminate the recursion. In fact, many style guides discourage or even forbid the use of recursion because of its potential problems. This is especially true in embedded systems. As we've witnessed, recursive functions can abuse the program stack by creating and destroying many stack frames. Deep recursion risks overflowing the call stack, resulting in a stack overflow. Let's revisit some of our previous examples to see how this might be a problem. Here's that countdown program from before. However, I've omitted the conditional statement that it was not negative. What happens when we pass in a negative number with this code? We got caught in an infinite loop, an infinite recursion, or an unbounded recursion. We just kept subtracting one and printing it out, never hitting our base case. Eventually it reached a segmentation fault. After 262,000 calls, this is because we've overflowed our stack. On my system, we have a maximum stack size of 8,192 kilobytes or about eight megs. This limit apparently corresponds to about 262,000 stack frames, each one containing local variables, parameters, and such. Eventually we ran out of that memory, resulting in a segmentation fault. We'd have the same problem if we forgot to make progress towards our terminating condition. Here it prints out 10 and recurses on the same value, 10, printing 10, printing 10 over and over again until we've overflowed our stack space. The issue with recursion is not that we can screw up and cause an infinite loop. We could do that with loops. The problem is that we're doing so by abusing our stack space. Another potential problem with recursion is that it can be extremely inefficient when not done properly. Again, we turn to the Fibonacci code that we wrote before. This is a perfect bad example, not only because it's a toy problem, but it highlights its inefficiency. The same computations were performed over and over and over again. Let's take a look at a small computation tree to see what I mean. Here's the computation tree for a recursive call to compute the sixth Fibonacci number. This results in two recursive calls, a call to Fibonacci of five and a call of Fibonacci to four. Each of those results in two more calls, and two more calls until you hit the base cases. If you'll notice, Fibonacci of four, for example, was computed twice. Fibonacci of three was computed three times, and Fibonacci of two was computed five times. You can imagine how big of a computation tree this would be if we tried even larger values. One way to avoid this inefficient recomputation is to use a method known as memoization. No, that's not a misspelling or a mispronunciation. It's the basic idea that you can cache values so that they can be reused later rather than recomputed every single time. Each recursive call checks to see if the value has already been computed. If it has, then that value is used and further recursion is avoided. If not, then we go ahead and pay for the recursion, but we cache and store the answer for later computations. Memoization has the effect of essentially pruning this computation tree, cutting off entire branches and making the computation more efficient. To see how much of a dramatic change this is, let's take a look at an example. Here I've got several implementations of functions to compute the nth Fibonacci number. Our values are gonna get rather large, so I've switched over to using a long, which is a 64-bit integer. 
Let's take a look at each one of these implementations. This first implementation is an iterative implementation. It uses a for loop to compute the next number, keeping track of the previous number and the current number in the sequence. The second implementation is our traditional recursive implementation. And this last implementation uses memoization. It passes in a table of values that have already been computed. Let's walk through it a little bit. First, it takes care of any corner cases. Then it checks the table. If the nth Fibonacci number has been computed in that table, then it uses that value instead of recomputing it. Negative one is our flag value to indicate that that value has not yet been computed. Otherwise, we pay for the recursion. We call this re function recursively, passing in the table on n minus one and n minus two. We save the result in a variable, cache it by putting it into the table, and then returning the result. In each one of these implementations, I'm keeping track of the number of times I call a function and reporting that up here. I'm also timing it. I'm keeping track of how many seconds it takes to actually compute the nth Fibonacci number with each one of these. Let's go ahead and go with the first implementation here. n is read in as a command line argument. The 10th Fibonacci number, as we've already seen, is 55. Here there was only one function call because this was the iterative version, and it took almost no time at all. We can compute other values of the Fibonacci sequence as well. Now let's do our recursive version and see how long it takes. Very similar to our iterative version. But as the number grows, it's taking more and more time. It took nearly seven seconds to compute the 45th Fibonacci number. Not only that, but it took over two billion function calls. Every time we go up, the execution time is going to grow exponentially. It's going to double about each time. It took 75 seconds or over a minute to compute the 50th Fibonacci number. Now let's change it so that we're using memoization and not doing all that repeated computation. Look at that, only 97 function calls and a time that's comparable to the iterative version. Compare that to 75 seconds and over 25 billion function calls. Let's just extrapolate how long it would take to compute the 100th Fibonacci number. Using memoization, we get the answer almost instantaneously. I'm not actually going to run it on the inefficient version. That would take too long. Let's just go ahead and estimate it. The Fibonacci sequence essentially grows exponentially. It would take about this many operations in order to compute the 100th Fibonacci number. To compute the 50th Fibonacci number required about this many operations. This gives us how much longer as a multiplier our execution time would be. The original execution time was about 75 seconds. And so this gives us a, an estimate of about 8.4 times 10 to the 16 seconds. How many years is that? About 2.6 billion years if we wanted to use the inefficient recursive implementation. This is not at all reasonable. Granted, computing the nth Fibonacci number is kind of a toy problem, but the same issues would be relevant 
when trying to solve a real problem with recursion.